very warm welcome. Uh, I'm sorry that my wife is not here. She, at the last minute, our daughter uh, hijacked her for babysitting. So for the next six weeks, she's babysitting in California. We have three grandchildren in California, three in India, and I am traveling around. Um, this year, we are <coughs> celebrating uh, 500th anniversary of the Reformation, as you know. But there are many other anniversaries. This is also the 100th anniversary of the Russian Marxist Revolution, uh, 100th anniversary of Finland's freedom. Uh, it was Lenin who set Finland free from uh, Russian imperialism. Um, but nobody is really celebrating the Marxist communist revolution in Russia. Uh, Jacques Barjan, a French-American historian, uh, in his book From Dawn to Decadence, he described uh, that the, although everything is called a revolution, Brexit is a revolution, Trump's election is a revolution, everything is called revolution these days, but he says that there have been five major revolutions during the last 500 years. Uh, the Russian communist revolution in Russia was a major revolution. It had a huge impact, some of which continues today. There are many countries that are still communist, and you wish that North Korea was not, or China was not, etc., but they are. So that was an influential uh, revolution, but a disaster, and that's why it's not being celebrated. Before that was French Revolution, uh, great idealism also had a lot of impact, continues to be respected in Western universities, etc., but ended up in a reign of terror and um, a dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, therefore, uh, there isn't going to be a celebration of uh, French Revolution either. Before that was the American Revolution, 10 years before the French Revolution, and it was a revolution that succeeded. And prior to that was the English Revolution, Civil War here, um, and Barjan says that both the English Revolution and the American Revolution were aftershocks of the uh, German Revolution, which was the Reformation. So Reformation, he calls the greatest revolution of the last 500 years, which has impacted the world, including England. It is uh, not very pleasant for me to say to Indians what India owes to Britain. And it's not very um, pleasant for me to say to British what Britain owes to Germans. Uh, but uh, I'm quoting a, a historian who says that English Revolution was actually an aftershock of the German, so British Reformation and English Revolution. Uh, I'm, because of the limitation of time, I'm going to focus mostly on Mahatma Gandhi to look, to get a handle into the impact of the Reformation through England on India, and uh, just a, a random beginning that Mahatma Gandhi was in South Africa in 1909 uh, working for the Indian community there, fighting against racism and discrimination, and South Africa was a British colony at that time, as was India. Uh, he happened to come here to London for some, some of his court cases and read an article by uh, Chesterton, which Chesterton, sitting in a pub, wrote in half an hour, uh, uh, mocking Indian uh, nationalism. That if Indians who are sitting here in Great Britain uh, begin to demand parliamentary democracy, vote <clears throat> to be the chief minister of, or prime minister of India, uh, uh, and uh, all the institutions that have been developed here in Britain, then he says, this is not Indian nationalism. 
if you were uh, saying that we, you go out, the British, and we will live according to our own genius, uh, our own traditions, our own philosophies, worldviews, and institutions, that would be Indian nationalism. So uh, Mahatma Gandhi was deeply impacted by uh, Chesterton's uh, mockery of what was called Indian nationalism, because Indian nationalism was basically uh, a shadow of the British nationalism. Uh, and uh, Indians wouldn't like that uh, to be told, but I'm actually going to take the liberty to offend you and say that, in fact, English nationalism uh, was a shadow of German nationalism. Europe didn't have an idea of nation. Europe had empires. You were part of the Roman Empire, so was Germany, so was uh, Spain at that time, 500 years ago, was uh, the uh, emperor, Spanish emperor, uh, ruling over Europe. So the idea of empire had come to Europe from Persia uh, in the Persian wars against the Greeks, and, but then the Greeks with Alexander the Great adopted the pagan idea of empire and um, you had empires, Russian empire and uh, Hungarian empire and Swedish empire and Spanish and Portuguese empire, uh, that was Europe. The Holy Roman Empire was called Christendom, but it was really the pagan concept of empire which had been christened or baptized as Christ's kingdom. But what Reformation did was not simply break the church, the Roman Catholic Church, into Protestant Church and Catholic Church, uh, but it broke the Holy Roman Empire. And that began in 1520 uh, with Luther's uh, letter, an open letter, letter to, German, to, to the nobility of German nation, an open letter to the nobility of G German nation, where he uh, begins to call upon kings, nobility in Germany, to hold the abuses of power by the church, uh, to hold the church accountable. And his letter begins with describing the three walls that the church has built around itself. The first of all is the separation of uh, state and church. That state has no authority to interfere with matters that belong to God's kingdom to the church. The church is the kingdom of God and therefore the temporal no, uh, royalty has no authority to, in, uh, to change anything to uh, hold the church accountable. But then Religious people, scholars, theologians cannot hold the church accountable either. That was the second wall because only the Pope has the authority to interpret the scriptures. Well, okay, as an individual theologian, you cannot hold the church accountable. Can you call together a council, church council, uh, which will hold the church and its abuse uh, to account? Uh, but the third wall was that no, only the Pope has the authority to call a council. These were the three walls which Luther begins to demolish. And the demolishing that first wall that the uh, king, the state, government cannot hold the church accountable when the church is abusing its power. Uh, this was what created the theological climate in which Henry VIII was able to break from the Roman church. So every school child knows that it was because he wanted divorce and because he wanted remarry and that the Church of England was born. But in fact, the theological ground for the king to hold the church accountable uh, came from Luther's 1520 uh, letter. Uh, so the Church of England, because of geography, um, was the first place where uh, the independence of the king from 
the whole Roman Empire and the Pope uh, became a reality. And then in 1505, 1555, Peace of Augsburg uh, was when the, <coughs> it was a truce between the Anglican, uh, Lutherans and uh, Catholics, Roman Catholics, that a prince can choose to be either a Lutheran or a Roman Catholic, and whatever is the religion of the prince, that becomes the religion of that state. Um, that was a significant milestone in religious tolerance. The problem was that it didn't give the same right to the Calvinists. Uh, so in Holland, uh, the 50-year war uh, began uh, against the plan which France and Spain, uh, Spanish nobility had uh, plotted to kill all the Calvinists, uh, those no nobility that had converted to Calvinism, to kill them. Uh, against that, the William of Orange, also called William the Silent, not the William of Orange who came here, but William of Orange in Holland, who is called William the Silent, who uh, uh, big organized the nobility to s fight against Spain, uh, which was the most significant practical uh, step in a religious, creating religious tolerance. That 50-year war led to the 30-year uh, religious war. So it was a total of 80 years of wars. Uh, 50 years were basically in Holland and Belgium. Um, last 30 years were with everyone out of which came the Peace of Westphalia, which is where Europe basically accepted the Jewish idea of nation. So Peace of Westphalia was um, the nucleus of Switzerland, for example, had existed for two, three hundred, four hundred years before that, uh, but um, uh, legally Switzerland became an independent nation only in uh, 1648. The same with Holland, Belgium, etc. And uh, Germany took time for political reasons, historical reasons. But uh, the idea of nation was a Jewish Protestant idea. And until three, four years ago, uh, nobody would allow me in a university town like Cambridge or Oxford or London to talk about nation, but nation has become the most important theology, one of the most important theological issues in Europe and the world. That's the problem with caliphate, that all those nations that were created by sykes pico agreement in the Middle East that used to be part of Ottoman Empire, uh, nobody taught them what is a nation and how to be a nation. So they are all failed nation states, Africa, as colonialism ended under pressure uh, with um, uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt pressurizing um, Winston Churchill to wind up uh, the British Empire and set these colonies free into nation. Nations were created um, uh, in Africa, in Asia, but nobody was teaching how to be a nation because Europe had turned against the concept of nation, blaming the German nationalism as the root of two world wars, but really the, um, the, the problem was the theological categories had become so confused because as a result of liberal theology in Europe, nobody was taking the Bible seriously in the 1920th century enough to learn from the Bible uh, what is God's idea of empire, God's idea of nation, God's idea of great nation, and God's idea of supranational reality. The Roman Catholic Church was right that the church is a supranational uh, institution. The concept of New Jerusalem, the concept of kingdom of God, these are supranational concepts, but what do they mean that the nations should walk in the light of the New Jerusalem. Uh, what does that mean? None of these things were being discussed because the Bible was not being taken seriously. 
uh, individualism had taken over, particularly evangelical theology, but later also liberal theology, that everything was about the individual, uh, but what God is saying uh, for how to, the nation should be governed, these things were not being discussed. Nevertheless, um, the, in September 18, uh, is when Chesterton's uh, article was published in the Illustrated London News, uh, which Mahatma Gandhi read. So from beginning in 1520, uh, Luther's letter to Ger nobility of German nation uh, to Ches Chesterton's article was the impact of uh, the Bible's idea of nation that had been crystallized in Europe in 1648, Peace of Westphalia, when empires began to be broken up. Of course, the Roman Empire was not formally dissolved until after, uh, uh, until Napole Napoleon. Uh, but we may come back to this discussion. I'm, I know at least one person here who would like us to spend more time on discussing, but my point to start uh, this evening is simply, the first point is that India's idea of a nation, India never had a concept of nation. What India had was thousand small little kingdoms fighting against each other. Alexander the Great also empired a concept of nation in India. So the Maurya Empire, which had become the great empire, particularly under Ashoka, um, was uh, an influence of Alexander the Great. Uh, the Chandragupta Maurya met Alexander when, when Alexander came up to India, and then he uh, began to unify these kingdoms, beat them in, in India to build an empire, but India was never able to sustain even empire, because sustaining an empire takes lots of organizational skill and management, which India didn't have. So, um, the, the, we finally had, we had the Mughal Empire, and when it was decaying, the British Empire took over. But while the concept of Indian geography, India never had a concept of geography either. Uh, the, India is not an Indian idea. Let me illustrate. Um, why are Native Americans Indians? That's because Columbus was trying to go to India and when he hit South America, he thought this is India. So they are Indians. But why are Native Australians Indians? Why is Indonesia Indian Asia? Because European mind was fascinated with India. And why was European mind was fascinated with India? India existed in Europe's mind because of the Bible. The book of Esther talks about India. It doesn't talk about China or Japan or Korea or Vietnam or New Zealand. So India is as far east as you can go. And the, as far west as you can go is Spain. So Paul talks about Spain in the New Testament. So if you've gone to India, you've gone to the end of the world. Spices were a factor, but uh, they were also trying to go to the end of the world. <coughs> so, the, I, so when Vasco da Gama, of course Columbus never reached India, but a few years later Vasco da Gama came to South India, Kerala, uh, through the sea route, there was trade through the um, uh, land route but as they were trying to find the sea route to India, uh, Vasco de Gama came. When he landed in Kerala, the southern India, no Malayali thought of himself, uh, well, there was no Malayalam, so no Keralite thought, and there was no Kerala either, uh, but uh, no Indian there thought of himself as an Indian. India existed in the in European mind because of the Bible. So the concept of geographic India came to India uh, from 
the Roman Catholic uh, reading of the Bible, but the concept of India as a political nation state came with uh, William Carey and others, uh, the Protestant reading of the Bible, because the, it was the Protestants who had understood that God doesn't want empire, he wants um, nation states. He destroys uh, the, M, the imperial city of Babel in Gen Genesis 11 to create nations that are described in Genesis 10. And then his goal is to bless these nations, to make them great nations, which is a concept that begins in chapter 12 of Genesis, that call to Abraham is that you come follow me, I will bless you, I will make you a great nation. And a great nation <clears throat> is different than nations. Uh, a nation is not a people group. That is an American evangelical myth. That nation means ethne, which means a people group. Genesis 10 defines nation three times as a sovereign people group in a given territory, governing themselves in their own language. Without that, you don't have a nation, uh, sovereignty, territory, language. But the great nation is bound not just by uh, ethnicity, but by the law. Abraham is told uh, that uh, Abraham will surely become a great nation because he will teach his children and, and his household, which is not part of his ethnicity, but legally, financially related to him. Uh, he will teach them to walk in God's ways, to do what is just and what is right. And this is what will make Abraham a great nation. Uh, Moses repeats that in Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 to 8, that I've given you all these laws, commandments, statutes, ordinances. If you obey them, you will become a great nation. And you won't have to be President Trump saying that we are the greatest nation. All your neighbors will see, and they will say that you are a great nation, etc. So we may pick that up uh, in the uh, Q&A, but here I just want to open by saying that the very concept of India as a geographic nation and a political nation state, sovereign nation state, these were ideas that came from uh, into Europe, starting from study of the Bible in uh, Germany, uh, but more clearly in Holland in the, during those 80 years, is it worth sustaining a fight, a war that long to become a nation free from Spanish Empire, Holy Roman Empire. And uh, how that happened in, during the Reformation um, is not the topic today, but just um, for those of you who are in, from India, <coughs> our national anthem is Jan Gan Man Adhinayak Jaiho. It's the first poem written by Tagore, the Nobel laureate poet, um, Ravina Tagore, which defines India's geography and poetry. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravin, Utkal, Banga. Uh, but if you look at the, his description of Indian geography, he leaves Kashmir out. Uh, and that is because the geography that he describes as India is taken from the 1899 British Stamp Act, um, the stamp paper on which you have agreements, uh, that Stamp Act had explicitly uh, left Kashmir out of India because British had won Kashmir. It is a Muslim majority uh, state, but it was ruled by the Sikhs. British won it, sold it to a Hindu, um, so this was not part of British India. And uh, so Tagore's geography, uh, which is, uh, becomes accepted as India's national anthem, which excludes Kashmir, comes from actually a British uh, act. So geography, uh, map making, these were not part of um, Indian tradition, Indian worldview mindset. 
their really biblical mindset. God is defining to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land, this territory. And as it begins in Genesis, but in Joshua, by the time Joshua 13 to the end, uh, the d detailed description of geography, maps, that this is uh, the land which belongs to this tribe and this is the boundary territory for this tribe, etc. So this map making became part of uh, the Bible's influence on the European mindset and it came to us from Europe, six, 1767 is when the first scientific establishment was established in India and continues till today, and that was Survey of India. Um, so, uh, th th this taking the Bible seriously, which the Reformation did, began to <coughs> create this idea of borders. So, of course, in EU, you don't like the idea of borders. You want borderless travel and uh, etc., which is fine, but. Should Russia take over Ukraine? Should Russia take over Finland or one of the nations which are always part of Russian Empire? You will say no. Why? What makes borders sacred? The borders were never sacred to India. Borders were never defined. Uh, because every year uh, a powerful king would have a horse sacrifice, Ashwamedh Yagya, trying to increase his border. So an empire has no interest in border. Islamic State has no interest in territory because it is trying to win the whole world. So an empire is a pagan prescription for war because empire doesn't respect borders. It is always trying to extend its border. But nation is God's idea for peace, God's recipe for peace. That you fight for your land, but you don't covet your neighbor's land. Because I've given that to Egypt or to Ishmaelites or to Edomites or to Sidonians. You don't covet their land. Uh, that's um, God's idea. And it was the Bible's impact on Europe that this idea of national borders as God's uh, recipe for peace uh, became important. But I've spent a lot of time there, so I will uh, leave that, uh, those thoughts as provocation for you, that although Christian theology for 50, 60, 70 years since Second World War has not been interested in talking about nation, the reality is that uh, now Europe is forced to talk about nation thanks to Brexit uh, and also thanks to Islamic State. Um, everybody has to talk about the concept of caliphate versus nation because caliphate is um, a religious idea of an empire. But let's move to seeing heart of uh, Gandhi, what Gandhi stands for in uh, mo most people's mind is Satyagraha, which is uh, truth's appeal. Satya is truth and uh, Agra is an appeal. Um, this is part of the modern age, which a university like Cambridge is no longer part of the modern age, that age is dead, which believe that the human mind can know truth. And in fact, that's the heart of the battle that Martin Luther is fighting, which Gandhi takes to India. That in India, all the gods and goddesses are depicted with weapons. So gods terrorize people with their powers, um, including magical powers that are magical weapons. It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. That's taking up your cross, which is what Gandhi does. So uh, you cannot understand 
uh, Gandhi without understanding the cross and understanding uh, Luther's uh, commitment when he's standing before the Diet of Worms. And the question is very simple that we're not going to debate your theology with you. We are asking you, are you going to recant of all these books that you have written, which you admit contradict what the church has been saying for a thousand years? So he owns, yes, these are my books. And these books discontradict what the church has been teaching at many points. So that means you're a heretic. We have already decided that. The question is, are you going to recant? So he asked for 24 hours to think and pray and before he gives his answer. And those are agonizing 24 hours. But through prayer, he finds the uh, God's grace and power to make his declaration that my conscience is captive to the word of God. I'm not being stubborn, I will recant, but only if you can persuade me from scriptures and plain reason. Not scripture alone, but from scriptures and plain reason, if you can persuade me. So this slogan, sola scriptura, scripture alone, has become a most misunderstood statement a slogan misunderstood by evangelicalism uh, because Luther is not saying scripture alone. Only when it comes to the conflict between the traditions of the church and the authority of the scriptures, then we stand with scripture alone. But you cannot even understand the scriptures without use of your mind. So the anti-intellectualism which developed out of the pietistic revivals, and the pietistic revival was <clears throat> the reaction to dead orthodoxy, where the preoccupation was with sound doctrine, not with reality of walk with God, a personal relationship with God. So in that context of European uh, church life, <laughs> where, which was preoccupied with dead orthodoxy, that a vibrant uh, spirituality was born called pietism, but it brought with it a dislike for the mind, anti-intellectualism, uh, which is not. So in, in the you know, universities were given up, and those who really loved God, really loved Jesus, really loved the Bible, they didn't go to the universities, they went to the seminaries. And the seminaries were saying the scripture alone means read only the scriptures. And that's not what Luther was teaching. That's not what the reformers were teaching. Many of the reformers were humanists, part of the Renaissance uh, movement, um, learned in Greek classics. Tyndale, who was here for at least a year before he uh, went to uh, Wittenberg and then Belgium, where he translated the Bible, uh, they were scholars. So in order to prove that he can translate the Bible, Tyndale, for example, had uh, translated a Greek classic text and taken it to the bishop to show his skill and ability as a translator. So they were all scholars, and they didn't mean that Christians should be reading scriptures alone. Uh, that is um, the current form of evangelicalism that don't go to university, go to the seminary, read scripture alone. Um, but that's not what uh, Luther is saying. But he is saying that God has spoken to us in his word. It is because the possibility of revelation has been given up by the universities through the Enlightenment movement that mind itself has to be discarded. So universities no longer believe that human mind can know the truth because they don't believe in revelation. But uh, if uh, you know, I'm tempted to do a review of uh, the film, um, The Man Who Knew Infinity, which is set here in Cambridge, uh, critiquing Barton Russell and the logical positivists here, uh, but I will refrain from yielding to that temptation. But what that film is saying that people like the atheists here in Cambridge, 
um, logical positivists destroyed the possibility of human mind knowing the truth because they left revelation out and uh, that, uh, that um, uh, man who knew infinity is an Indian mathematician who was invited here in Cambridge wouldn't make him a fellow but the Royal Society of Science made him a fellow and therefore Cambridge was forced to relent but he went back to India to bring his wife but died there so he never actually came here and um, it was these um, atheist mathematicians here and that was the first time in the beginning of the 20th century around the first world war where mathematics was an attempt was being made here in Cambridge to ground mathematics in atheism um, but uh, m mathematics, in fact, is an argument for the soul, for the spirit, uh, traditionally in Western intellectual history. But another question, uh, that's another point where I will not go on right now. Uh, so uh, the, my point at this moment, my second point is that you can't understand Gandhi's Satyagraha, appeal for truth, which uh, finally wins freedom for India, uh, not because of his appeal for truth. Uh, Churchill was an imperial prime minister. He would not have given freedom to India, um, but it was thanks to Franklin Roosevelt's uh, pressure upon Churchill um, through the Atlantic Charter in 1941. Um, uh, which was signed in January, 1st January 1942, which is the basis for the birth of the United Nations. Uh, so Roosevelt forced Churchill that you, you can't ask America to support you because you, the British Empire, are as bad as Hitler. He's taking over parts of Europe, but you have taken over India and South Africa and New Zealand and Canada and this, that, and the other. Why should America support your imperialism? Because German nationalism is under Hitler is not nationalism, it is German imperialism. So if you want America to support you, you have to give up uh, your empire. And that is what actually led to the end of Spanish Empire and Portuguese Empire and French Empire. Only the Russian Empire continued um, because they were part of the victors. Uh, but the uh, Gandhi standing up against empire on the, with the appeal of truth is Martin Luther is Protestant Reformation, but we can discuss it more. The third point of the impact of um, the Protestant Reformation upon India is the linguistic revolution. German language is not a literary language at 500 years ago. Anybody who reads, reads in Latin. There are universities, uh, Heidelberg, Prague actually was a German university, but now Prague is not part of Germany. Heidelberg is the oldest German university, but Luther himself is in Wittenberg University, and there is uh, Augsburg and many other universities in Germany at that point. There are universities, but no school system in Germany, no school systems anywhere in Europe at 500 years ago. Uh, but Luther takes, uh, while he's hiding in the castle of Wartburg, um, he's been kidnapped uh, by his friends, by Frederick the Wise, and hidden in his castle in Wartburg. He's grown his beard and um, pretending to be a knight, but he has the time he's translating the Bible, New Testament at that point. And it is that fact that giving people the word of God in their own language, but people who speak German dialects, they don't actually read dialects. Now, Luther's family had um, lived on and off between areas speaking high German and low German, so he knew both. So he uh, 
takes his knowledge of both the dialects to create a literary German language and creates German. Now, uh, Tyndale here in Cambridge, he studied in Oxford, but uh, it was here in Cambridge where he really got exposed to Luther's teaching. So, uh, at least Cambridge was one city which was not embarrassed of learning from Germans. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, I can talk about the German Reformation here. Um, so he, when none of the bishops, he spends a whole year, Tyndale, trying to get permission from English bishops to give him the authority to translate the New Testament. Why did he need that permission? Uh, because more than 100 years before him, 120 years before him, the Archbishop Arundel, he had uh, banned uh, the Constitution of Arundel, he had banned Wycliffe Bible, so Wycliffe Bible was translated in Oxford before printing existed in Europe. Therefore, Wycliffe Bible was never printed. It was hand copied, but it was made illegal. So you, if, if you were found copying or owning a copy of Wycliffe Bible, you will be burnt alive, uh, uh, strangled or burnt here in England, because England was very intolerant like rest of Europe. So, it, so it, it was illegal to translate the Bible into English without uh, permission of the bishop, and the bishops wouldn't give the permission. Therefore, Tyndale goes to uh, Wittenberg, spends a year or so with Luther, and then comes to Belgium to complete his translation, to print the New Testament, and to smuggle it uh, into England uh, because it was, England was not allowed to have English Bible. So you did have Wycliffe Bible and then you did have poets uh, like um, uh, Canterbury Tales is uh, Wycliffe Bible's influence, the Lollardi movement, um, Chaucer's Parson is a Lollard, a follower of Wycliffe. So, but English literature was not being printed in, in England. Nobody was reading English. And even today, if you read uh, Wycliffe Bible, chances are that you won't understand a paragraph. You might understand a sentence, but it's very hard because it's very different English. The English that we do speak, which became King James English, is really Tyndale's English. So, it's the impact of uh, Luther that creates the English language. Also, Finland, this is the 100th anniversary of Finland as a free nation. Uh, a Finnish uh, Bible scholar, Agricola, he went also along with Tyndale to Luther and translated the Bible into Finland, which is what created the Finnish identity because Finland was for centuries part of a colony of Sweden, then for centuries it was colony of Russia. It was never a nation. But what made it a nation was uh, the Finnish Bible uh, translated by Agricola. So what Luther begins, what the Reformation begins, is a linguistic revolution to Forget, not forget, you should study uh, Greek. Very few people knew Greek at that time, but certainly Latin, you should study Latin, you should study Greek. But to really reform the nation, to unleash the potential of the masses, to make free market economy where everyone can contribute to economy, uh, to make democracy possible if the decisions are uh, of the a nation are not in the language of the people. If the court runs, uh, does not run in the language of the people, you can't have people participate in governing their own nation. So this linguistic rev revolution uh, becomes fundamental to democratic revolution, <clears throat> to economic revolution, etc. And this is 
what uh, 200 years later, uh, William Carey, a cobbler, who could not study, come to Cambridge, and he could not go to Oxford, and because he was a Baptist, he was not an Anglican. He had to be an Anglican to study in these universities, and he had to be a boy, um, which he qualified, but because he was a, um, of course, now you can't even call someone a boy easily without getting into trouble. Uh, but um, <clears throat> that's another story. So, uh, T William Carey comes to India. It's a cobbler, self-taught, who um, believes the Bible that God has commanded us to go and disciple all nations. So the Baptists send him to India, and on the way in the, in the ship itself, he's beginning to learn Bengali so he could translate the scriptures into Bengali because that's the heart of the British um, sort of uh, rule in India. And then uh, others join him, and by the end of his life, 36, 40 languages, the Bible has been translated and published. But nobody uh, reads those uh, languages because at the time when William Carey comes to India, what is the court language of India? Urdu doesn't exist. Um, Persian. The Mughals had been ruling, and Mughals are not Persians. But uh, after Babur, who established the Mughal Empire, and this is more for those who are from India, uh, his son Humayun lost the battle and ran away from India, uh, hid in Persia. The Persian emperor sent 14,000 soldiers with him to reconquer um, his father's kingdom around Delhi. And um, <clears throat> so Humayu then makes Persian the court language of India, where nobody speaks Persian. There are lots of Muslim rulers in India. Um, they are from Afghanistan and Central Asia, etc. Uh, they don't speak Persian. So the idea of making Persian the language of the court was that the affairs of the court should be secret. Persian becomes the language of discrimination, just as Sanskrit had been a Hindu language of discrimination, an elitist language to keep people away from the state secrets. But God's knowledge, God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's 1 Timothy 2, 4. <clears throat> Paul is not saying that is evangelicalism which says that God wants all men to be saved. Paul is saying God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, as an apostle, I'm a preacher and a teacher of the truth to Gentiles. That's 1 Timothy 2, 7. So I, uh, as an apostle, I'm a preacher as a preacher, my role is to cultivate faith, but I'm also a teacher uh, of um, truth to the Gentiles because God wants all men to uh, be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So that's why the Reformation is giving the word of God, the knowledge of God to everyone in their language. But the problem is that there is no school system in Europe, there is no school system in um, in India. So once you begin to give the scriptures, you have to, um, I will return to this in a moment, you also have to have universal education. So today you take universal education for granted that every child has to go to school. But in 1520, in that letter, uh, open letter to nobility, Christian nobility of German nation, is the first time when Luther is seeing the implication. The, this is uh, his uh, political manifesto, 1520. <clears throat> but in that political manifesto uh, is where he articulates the doctrine of priesthood of all believers. We'll return to that in a few minutes. 
But the implication of priesthood of all believers is that all uh, must become priests. So while the universities are created to train priests for the church, God wants every believer to be a priest. Every believer must learn to read and write, and they must learn to read the Bible. And that's what drives <coughs> the, uh, his call for universal education. So Reformation is the uh, movement that brings education to every child. Now, in 1524, <coughs> Luther writes a second letter. This one is addressed to the elders, municipal councilmen, in all the cities, Christ, uh, Christian cities of German nation, where he is saying to the um, elders that it is your responsibility to educate. You cannot teach. The church has the educated a class of priests who should be teaching Monday to Friday. Um, but the church does not have the means to build school buildings and maintain them. So in 1524, he is uh, arguing that the elders, the municipal council in every city in Germany, must build schools and maintain them. By 1530, Luther is finding that, yes, now municipal councils are building school buildings, but parents are not sending their children to school. Why? Oh, winter is coming. The village has to be kept warm. The boys can't go to school. They have to go and cut trees, supply wood. We can't send our daughters to school because winter is coming. What will the cows eat? Uh, the girls have to go and cut the grass. But now the winter has come. There is no grass. Well, we can't send the girls to school because they have to turn the milk into cheese, butter. What shall we eat? How shall we stay warm? So Luther gets furious. So in 1530s, in fact, his sermon he preaches to the church, uh, <clears throat> but he has no internet and no radio, no television, so his sermon isn't heard everywhere. So he writes out his sermon, but parents to whom he is addressing, they don't actually read. So he publishes it so that Lutheran priests will read his sermon and will preach. And the argument of his uh, 1530 letter is, that you are saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? How shall we stay warm? This is what pagans seek. You must seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Then all of these things will be added unto you. So he builds that case. What does it mean to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness? It means to send your children to school and to keep them there. Now, there is no empirical evidence that an educated nation would be a richer nation. But all his arguments are believed. So he has no empirical uh, data to prove that if you send your children to school, you will become richer than Spain or France. His, he's not a bishop. He's not a pope. He's not an emperor. He's believed because he's expounding the Bible. Now, Scotland, uh, Scottish Reformation is better able to take up his idea, and Scotland becomes the first uh, really educated nation in Europe. England then follows. Uh, so a lot of science and inventions develop in Scotland before they come to England, but we won't take the time to that, except to say that India had three classical languages at that time, 200 years ago when William Carey comes to India, um, Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit. All of these were languages of discrimination. Every single, today we have 18 or so official languages, but 100 or so languages in which the Bible exists. Every single modern Indian language became a literary language because of Bible translators. So a friend of mine, Babu Varghese, 
he wrote the 700 page thesis, PhD thesis, uh, which was published as Let There Be India, in which he shows that uh, it was the Bible translators following the Reformation, following Luther and Tyndale, who turn oral dialects into literary languages. Once they've done that, then they have to have schools, they have, they uh, introduce printing, printing press, literature, and another friend of mine is now writing a book on how the Bible impacted all of Indian literature in every single language, um, but I'm running out of my time. So let me go to the last point of um, the impact of the Reformation upon India. This is where India is still struggling. Um, we, we are a caste-based society, thanks to Hinduism, where you had a four major caste division of five, and then 6,000 or so sub-castes. Inequality was the norm in India. Now, what does that mean? It means simply that if there are, if, if you're planting an apple orchard and you have pl space to plant 100 apples, you plant 15 good variety of apple, take good care of them, fence them, give them everything needed. But 85 plants you don't care for, you don't look after them, you don't protect them, fence them. You are going to be a poor farmer. If you want to develop as a farmer, you have to pay more attention to those 85 plants uh, that are poor. Now, India was a poor society, is a poor society. We have a lot of wealth in absolute numbers, but we also have uh, some of the poorest people in the world, uh, vast people who can't live at subsistence level. Because they were on religious ground treated as unequal because it was never self-evident to our sages, any of our sages in India, that all men are created equal. This was not self-evident to Germans, and this was not self-evident to British. You still have class system, but it was much worse back then. Um, this was not self-evident to Americans. Tomorrow is 4th of July. We will celebrate the Declaration of Independence. But what most Americans don't know is <clears throat> that even at that time, it was not self-evident to Americans that all men are created equal. Today, if the Congress was writing the Declaration of Independence, it will have to write, we hold these ideas to be politically correct, that all men, women, and transgenders are, have evolved equal. But nobody will believe it because evolution is not about equality. Evolution is an explanation of why species and races are unequal. The reason the Declaration of Independence was able to assert was because <clears throat> Whitfield, who came 13 times to England, took Luther's idea of priesthood of all believers to America and he was the first white man who began preaching to the blacks. And the white Christians got very upset at him. Do you want us to be drinking Holy Communion from the same cup as our slaves? So in 1740, Whitfield started writing a series of articles to explain Luther's idea of human equality. Of course, human equality begins in Genesis 1 when men, are made, men and women are made in God's image. But in Europe, the idea of human equality began with Luther when he discovers in the Bible priesthood of all believers, which becomes the basis for him to demolish the first wall which the church has erected. Uh, that's why Henry VIII was able to become the head of the Anglican Church, 
because he is also a priest, if all believers are priests. So, the different discussion, no time for that now. But, <clears throat> so from uh, 1740, <clears throat> Whitfield begins to teach in a series of articles to the reading Americans that all men are equal. That's what creates the intellectual consensus. So, the original draft, Thomas Jefferson writes is that we hold these truths to be sacred and unalienable, meaning derived from sacred scriptures. Now, one of the most uh, important popularizer of Whitfield was Benjamin Franklin. So, Benjamin Franklin later agrees with the teaching that all men are created equal, but instead of saying all men, we hold these truths to be sacred, he adopts the Scottish epistemology of common sense from um, Thomas Reed and changes the language that we hold these truths to be self-evident. But those truths were self-evident to Americans only because Whitfield had expounded the Bible for 30 years to teach human equality. Now, this is what came to India. So, you have Mahatma Gandhi on the right side uh, sweeping. Uh, most lower caste Hindus uh, mock him, and this is also really a mockery of this cartoon of Gandhi versus Ambedkar. I won't go into that controversy right now. But the reality is that even when he was in South Africa, he had decided that he and his wife will clean the toilets for him and for everyone else. So he was sincere. He had really learned this lesson of equality um, in here in England, when he was in England, through the Bible, uh, that um, we should, all human beings are equal, so a lawyer from a merchant caste uh, can clean and sweep. So, uh, this um, is just a few uh, thoughts that I am dropping right now, uh, that the modern India is a creation of the Bible. The Bible created modern India through the Reformation. A lot of these truths were adopted, secularized by the Enlightenment, and uh, people like Gandhi and Nehru took these ideas both as biblical and Enlightenment. But um, the Reformation is the force that uh, applied the Bible to uh, the creation of what is modern India. So, India still believes that India can be reformed. So, we have a militant Hindu party ruling India, but they believe in reformation while much of Europe has become quite pessimistic and America has become quite pessimistic that it uh, well, cannot be reformed. Uh, but uh, this legacy of the reformation that future can be better than the present or the past is uh, optimism is a huge gift of um, the biblical reformation to my nation. Let me stop there. Thank you. We'll take some questions. Sure. Yeah.